Awesome. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I trust everyone is doing great. I think we are ready to get this show on the road. Um, thank you, Jesus, for a wonderful time in your presence. And um, let's kick things off, shall we? Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Um, so I think we should say an opening word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and in our minds. Thank you for what you're doing in the church. Thank you, Spirit, so God, for leading and guiding. Thank you for infusing. Thank you for manifesting. Thank you for the great things that you've set up, set us up for. We bless your name, Heavenly Father. We say thank you, Lord God. Even at this time, we want to honor you, glorify, magnify, exalt, Lord Jesus. Um, thank you, Jesus. We say thank you because truth is currently being unveiled and details, things are being set in place. And our hearts are committing even more fully to your agenda, to your plan, to your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, thank you so much for joining us, beloved. Um, my name is Francis Seabor Jr. And um, son of Francis, Pastor Francis and um, Pastor Mrs. Seabor. I want to welcome you to today's Melchizedek School of Priesthood. Um, a little bit different from what we're used to. Um, but we trust the Lord that um, that is a sign of good things to come, right? Hallelujah. And um, so... Continuing the narrative we've been on now, um, Mama has been teaching on the infusion of God's word, our union with God's word, our becoming one with the word of God, and the fruit of this being the tangible experience of the things the word has spoken concerning us. And um, this is very vital in our walk as believers. This is very essential. Hallelujah. In, um, let me make sure. I think we should be good to go. Yes, yeah. Hallelujah. Um, very essential for God's purposes, what God had in mind. And uh, I think we'll kick off from there <clears throat> for the sake of um, um, context also, um, because many of the things that, so I'll give some context for why we are seeing um, the engagements of God's word as so critical in our Christian walk. Uh, we explained several weeks ago, I think the last time I was there, um, we, I gave, um, explain, oh, we've been on this journey. Um, it's the journey we've been on, to be honest with you, on ex, you know, basically explaining how um, creation um, um, is like a picture, was meant to be a picture of God. And that picture or image and likeness of God is the tabernacle, God's dwelling place. Um, in other words, God only dwells in things that look like him. Okay, this, is, this has to be clearly understood. So whenever we see the tabernacle, uh, we know it looks like God. It doesn't look like God by form. Amen. God's image is not a form. God's image is not really having two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Um, I know we've been taught that for years. Hallelujah. That um, the image and likeness of God, you know, human beings look like God because we have two eyes and God has two eyes and all these wonderful things. Hallelujah. Um, Yes, and um, I want to encourage you um, with the truth that um, that is just not true. that is not true. God is beyond having two eyes and a nose and a mouth. The dogs have these things, right? And um, you can do a painting, Hallelujah, where you see someone with two eyes, you know, and then you can, you know, the image of a person, Hallelujah, means that you're able to recognize someone. All right. So when we talk about the image of God, it means something about recognizing God. Now. Yes, there is a portion of the likeness of God that these creatures, you know, animals, plants, um, you know, rocks, matter in general, everything is able to, I say mimic or, yes, offer up. They're able to offer up some measure uh, of the likeness of God, very, very heavily diluted and to a very great degree. Um, but even these measures themselves, how do I phrase this now? It's not in their form, really. So it's not like, a monkey looks like God because it has two eyes and a nose. No. Hallelujah. There is something called functionality. Okay? And this is what, in Hebrew language, whenever um, someone is, looks like someone, it's not because you bear the person's image the way we understand someone's image now as in a likeness. Okay? It means that you can function in that person's stead. So my image and my likeness, okay, in a company will be someone that can take my place, not someone who looks like me. Does all this make sense? So um, in God's pursuit of a dwelling place, okay, in God's pursuit of his image and his likeness, the Bible said that God made man, right? And God made man to come into the image and likeness of God. And we explained 
that it wasn't just man that bore this resemblance, but that even creation is meant to actually be a tabernacle, a resting place of God. And we've explained you know, this thoroughly throughout um, several episodes of Melchizedek School. And then we arrived at um, many conclusions, one of them being that creation coming into this image and likeness of God is not going to be creation achieving this by herself. Obviously, God has had her on this journey, right? Creating, you know, molding creation, sculpting creation with his words, amen, giving decrees. The ages were framed by the word of God. So God has been framing um, um, the different days of creation, right? And so after all these days of framing, we then continue, all right, to um, on a specific day, the sixth day, where God says, I want to make my the fullness of my image and likeness. So it's like creation got to this spot or this point, right, where creation could now, it was like from this point onwards, um, a measure of this measure of the likeness of God was sufficient to um, bring forth what was in God's heart. So we know the fullness of what is, God, is in God's heart has not been seen yet. But to a very great deal, after the, you know, at the end of the sixth day, as God was making man, which is where we're still in, to be honest with you, because until God's wishes are fulfilled, until God says that what he wanted is good, there is not going to be an end of this age. Hallelujah. So, um, hallelujah. So if you look at, um, let me just see if I can do a quick run through here. Okay. Um, God saying that things were good is not just saying they're good as in, oh, that's cool. Okay. God saying that things were good um, is actually um, him saying that this thing looks like me, okay? Jesus Christ said, nothing or no one is good except for God. He was saying that unless something looks like God, it is not good. So that approval that God was giving all throughout all the days of creation, hallelujah, um, these, these approvals were, was God saying, I can see my resemblance here. Now, it doesn't mean that um, God looks like a tree, again, not by form, but by function right? Doesn't mean that God looks like a planet, not by form, but by function, okay? So there's all of these functionalities that God carries, okay? That God stewards, that God, that, you know, they exist inside of God, all these operations of God, and God wants to give them expression. And God's desire for giving them expression is very crucial because basically what is going to be happening is that God in his current invisible state, God's form, um, his true form is invisible, he, he cannot be seen or known. In other words, the operations of God are mysterious. They are beyond comprehension. But for the sake of comprehension, for the sake of experience, and God is doing this because God is a God of love and of community. God is looking for partnership, for community, for family. And he wants to share um, himself with everything, if that makes sense. God wants to share himself. He Love wants to give, Right? And that's who God is. So that the mystery of that nature in and of itself, God even wants to share what being love is. And in effort to do that, hallelujah, creation was, was birthed. And at the core of creation was, God, was God's desire, humanity. The peak or the, the well, I say the nexus of God's ambitions, God's hopes, God's dreams is found in humanity where Humanity in its seed form in Genesis chapter six, chapter one, sorry, and then chapter two was meant to blossom into the image and likeness of God. Now we know that man, when God first made man, was on an image and likeness of God simply because God explicitly, if you read Hebrews chapter, um, chapter one, we know that the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person is Jesus, the word of God, right? And Jesus came as a second Adam. When Jesus Christ came as second Adam, he bore a measure of the likeness of God the same way that Adam did, but he was not the fullness, right? He wasn't the express image of God's person. This is something that Jesus Christ grew into when he became the weos of man, the mature man. We explained this during word for now yesterday. And when he became the weos of God, you see this in Romans chapter one, um, the very first few verses when the Bible explains Jesus Christ came as a son of David, according to the flesh, but he did not, I repeat, he did not become the son of God until Amen. Until he was raised from the dead. Now, he experienced varying degrees of adoption or varying degrees of maturity because humanity in its humanity is, for lack of better words, God's offspring. That's the truth. God wanted to um, birth himself. But 
God in seed form is not what he's looking for. God wants to see himself functionally, okay? And so in seed form, we have Adam. Adam was meant to grow, just like how you plant a seed, right? It doesn't look like a mango tree. But as you plant it, over time, it begins to bring forth, you know, leaves, um, the stem, the root systems, um, flowers, budding, and eventually the fruits. They, they can now be seen, okay? So God wanted man to go through these stages of development until man looks like God. Now, that's a place where man looks like God. When man looks like God, he's, he receives these, let's say, names. Um, the anointed one, the weos, the one that is um, the weos of God, the anointed one, the weos of man, the developed one, the adopted one, right? The beloved son in whom God is well pleased, the one where God finds all of his pleasure. Now, the reason why he's called the Messiah, the anointed one, is because all of God's power. If you read the book, if you read the, um, the story of the Bible, the first character of the Godhead that was introduced was the Holy Spirit, right? And the Holy Spirit, um, for lack of better words, captures the fullness of the power of God. He's called the Spirit of Might. And whenever you see God doing anything, the Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit has to be there because He is the one. That is the manifester of the things of God. Whenever God wants to bring something into tangibility, into substance, the Holy Spirit is the last. He's the one that actually brings it out. He makes things appear. So when God says, let there be light, all right, all of the Trinity, they all have their parts to play, but the person that actually brings forth light is the Spirit of God. And we even see that even the work of bringing forth that image and likeness of God seen in Genesis chapter 1, the very last, very last um, few verses, when God said, let's make man in our image and after our likeness, it was the Holy Spirit. Amen. That, um, that um, the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter one, that he was declared to be the son of God with power, amen, by the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection from the dead. So the Bible says that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit, right? If the spirit that raises Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will also give life quick in your mortal bodies. So the Spirit of God, amen, is the one that manifests this. Now, the reason why this is important is because all of the Holy Spirit's operations, all right? Well, let me phrase it like this. All of the Holy Spirit's power, all right? God wants everything to be committed. The, God wants the fullness of the power of God, the fullness of the Godhead, everything to be found in humanity so that humanity can function the same way that God functions. Um, God's desire for doing all of this is so that Humanity can function in his stead. Again, what I've said before about image and likeness, right? To do this would mean that all of the Godhead, man would have to be able to participate in the fellowship um, that the Godhead fellowships in. Like when God said, let there be light, who is he talking to? That community he's speaking to, all right? All right? That community, man has to be a part of that, right? And man also has to be the part, a part of the process of bringing forth light out of darkness, right? So for us to achieve all of these things, those operations of the spirits of God, we also have to receive that functionality as well. The reason why um, this is important is because humanity, all right, for lack of better words, where God wants humanity to get to is a place where humanity can function as every member of the Godhead. That's what the image and likeness of God means. So when we say Holy Ghost move, or when we see the Holy Ghost moving, is because a human being is doing something. That is God's vision, God's dream. That what the, the future of creation, the future ages of creation, humanity is going to steward God's plans and purposes, and humanity will be manifesting. The same way the Holy Spirit was brooding, humanity will be brooding over the waters, and we will be manifesting, okay? Everything in God's heart and mind. Someone says that that sounds like we're usurping too much power to ourselves. There is no need for concern because that is actually God's desire. God actually wants to give us his throne. He wants us to sit on his throne. If you read the Bible very carefully, you see that God wants to share his very life. In fact, God wants to share his very form. There is nothing that is off the table as far as God's sharing is concerned. God is very committed. God is serious. In fact, the, the language the picture uses for us sharing with God is covenant, the picture of marriage, where a husband and a wife, they, they are naked before each other and they give everything to each other, everything, leaving behind nothing, okay? This is actually what God has in mind. This is what God has in store for us. So when God sees us, he sees, sees union, he sees covenant, he sees marriage with us. This is very important that we understand this. Now, someone can say, what about the risk of God losing creation? You know, the devil sinned against God 
And because the devil sinned against God, um, um, he could usurp authority from Almighty God. Now, all of those thoughts, okay, um, uh, you know, um, come because of a fundamental misunderstanding of many things about the power of God. The way, you know, we oftentimes think that gifts are the power of God, amen? And because of that, when you see someone working in a gifting, you say, the power of God is at work. And that's true, right? Said factually so. That's said correctly. But the truth is that God's power, God's wisdom, amen, God's um, redemption, everything is under one, one encrustment, one, one um, entity. That entity is Christ, the anointed one. The anointed one is the one that receives all of the operations of the spirits of God. I'm going to say that again, okay? The anointed one is the one that receives all of the operations of the spirits of God. Not just the spirits of God, he receives all the operations of God altogether, as in the roles that the Father, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, all humanity is going to take everything. I know this is true because Jesus Christ said something. All power, all right, in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, baptize nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He specifically identifies what we should baptize humanity with, the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. Those names are not titles. It's not, those are not words. Those are operations of God. Those are workings of God, the internal structure of God. Humanity is meant to come into embodying everything. Now, when we embody everything, someone will look at us and say, that is the Holy Spirit at work, but they see human being. That is Jesus at work, but they see human being. That is God, the Father, sitting on the throne, but they see human being. God's desire is that humanity will embody everything about God. This is what God desires to do. It is God's plan, not our own. We are not trying to seize authority from God. God wants to do this. And God is not afraid of doing this. You know why? Because the image and likeness of God does not allow you to do some things. That is the truth. In God's form, he is incapable of some things. We say God can do everything. Not true. God cannot do some things. God cannot lie. The laws of God, as given to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, amen, or from Mount Sinai, they explicitly show the, um, the heart postures of God. God cannot lie. God cannot steal. God can, in fact, the Bible says that he that is born of God cannot sin. Amen? Because the seed of God remains in him. Now, these laws, as we approach the zenith, right, of our conformity with the image of Christ as a church, as we approach these visions of who God wants us to be, Amen. When I say approach, I mean like as we, yes, as we approach, as our, as our consciousness rises, as we, as we awaken out of our slumber, as that reality dawns on us, amen, what will be happening is that we'll find ourselves incapable of doing some things. The thought of rebelling against God because you've seen someone with a gifting act funny is not on the table. No, no. What God wants, the way that God wants us to come into his image and likeness, that process flushes out the ability to do something. Because on route to come to the image and likeness of God, that form doesn't allow us. You cannot be in the image and likeness of God and do something. Papa would say this oftentimes, that how can you want to represent God and yet you're acting in this way? And the reason why I say that is because there is no consistency. There is a, some kind of conflict between some things that people are doing and the image and likeness of God they're meant to represent. Now, that's, that's um, conundrum, paradox, confu that little confusion right there only exists when you have all you have are giftings. And I explained giftings before. Giftings are like multipliers of your spirit man's capabilities, okay? That, um, I say multipliers as in well, they multiply your soul's ability to manifest, right? Your, where your will, your, even not your will, maybe your subconscious will, okay? A gifting allows your soul to tap into your spirit man's functionality, okay, without the need of, on, you know, of, um, of the required development. So, for example, you would see someone working with um, the gift of word of knowledge when they just got filled with the Holy Spirit today. Or they get filled with the Holy Spirit and they start speaking in tongues and interpreting and different things or whatever. These things are multipliers. And I say multipliers meaning that they... I think Ken Hagen first explained this to me. <laughs> yes, he explained this to me personally through his messages that I downloaded on the, off the internet. <laughs> um, he explained that the gift of faith, when it, it is at work, it multiplies your in, inert or internal, like your nat natural faith, your natural, your, your, the, the gift of faith in the, in the first reading chapter 12 is a multiplier where you experience faith several times 
what you are able to give. So normal, normally faith comes by hearing, right? That's, that means by your, your um, spiritual senses being vulnerable to the, to the word of God. Um, or your, your, um, the ga your gateways, right? The gateways of your heart being open to the word of God or God's word sitting on the throne of your soul. When you have God's word sitting on the throne of your soul, that is, that is what, where faith comes, right? So faith comes and here comes to God's word. It's God's word, interacting with God's word over time on each of your gateways is what you know, opens up the gateways of your heart. And just for, um, for help here, your heart and your subconscious and unconscious are very, very similar, okay? Your heart is, speaks about the depths of consciousness, okay? The place where even our ability to perceive reality sits, okay? Hallelujah. So, um, I'm saying this because getting to that place requires intentionality. You have to be intentional in driving God's word into your heart. Now, once you're able to find a channel in there, that means by which you get there is called a spiritual sense. It's called a gateway. It's also called a throne of the soul. And I'm saying that because you literally have to use God's word to conquer that channel. The, the, the Christian walk is about is victory with God's word, using God's word to invade the soul intentionally. So that you can manifest who you are. Because the issue that we have as believers is that, I'm going to be going ahead of myself here, but we as believers, everything I just described about who God is and what his, his plans for us and everything, whatever, we're already in that state right now. But because, and it's scary because, because of how powerful we are in being in that state, we can render our being in that state. We, we, we're so powerful because of what God has done that the decision of even manifesting that state is still up to us. Does that make sense? We can choose to manifest that form if we want to. Now, the ability to even want to, to be, even conceive it, okay, requires that God's words traffic, traffic through the heart. Because if not, um, if not for that need, what would happen is that we would, if not for that need, meaning that there's something that is hindering that, if that makes sense, we would organically just manifest the fullness of God. I mean, manifest it, be tangible, it'd be seen. And there would be no need for doubt. The problem is, um, in the current state that we find ourselves in, we have strong belief systems that are frustrating that appearance. Strongholds, the Bible refers to them as high things, wisdoms, knowledge. Okay, um, these things they even they don't give room for us to even conceive. As a child of God, even me, me saying that God wants us to sit on His throne, some people can have things in their hearts welling up with, almost with anger. How can you say that, Almighty God? How can you say, "Well, God is God"? We are, we are, we are, we are ah! you know, So you can have those things work on the inside of you, okay? And you think in your mind you're defending God, and it's the devil that's at work. Work the devil has done over time, large in our memories that we have accepted to be true, okay? That we're holding on to. They are now fighting the emergence of Christ on the inside of you, Christ in the flesh. Okay, I'm gonna try and retrace my steps here because I think I've gone really, really far, but. Um, um, that nature of God, you know, these giftings, sorry, these giftings, um, they're multipliers. Now, they're, they're able, you're able to function in a specific dimension or specific operation of God um, in the measure of giftings without, even though you've not experienced the development that is necessary. So most of the time, for you to be able to lay hold on kingdom operations as, they, as you ought to, you ought to go through several learning processes, right, of the nature and likeness of God. And that word of God that is going to yield its power to you, okay, basically what's going to be, so let me, let me, let me hammer this through, okay. Hallelujah. We we'll trust God for mercy, okay. Adam, when God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adam's objective in the Garden of Eden, all right, I'm going to be very explicit here, okay. The Garden of Eden was not a place I can almost even just stop right there, right? It wasn't really a place per se. It is a place. It's more of a state of being, right? Where you're able to access the core of the archives of the speakings of God that were stewarded by angelic beings we refer to as cherubim. Now, cherubim are creatures that God has placed in, you know, in, in, um, um, in this present age that um pre that are currently for lack of better words they are holding um for lack of better words um, measures of the likeness of god as his word and i'm not saying the very core word of god per se i said i was putting it like this there is something that these creatures have which when they 
minister it to us and we receive it from them, they unlock something on the inside of us. That's the best way I can say it. Now, what these creatures have, they have measures of God's wisdom in a shadow. And I'm saying a shadow in the form because no creature can actually bear the weight of the wisdom of God except for human beings. Okay. They bear measures of God's word. And I say that measures for that same, ex same exact reason. Okay. And I'm saying all these things because what they actually come with, man, many times you have encounters with these creatures. Now, let me look at something. Okay. I am being very particular about some of these things because we're getting to a time where as believers, our knowledge, our bankrupt, archaic, um, simple, primitive understanding of spiritual operations is going to become hazardous to us because of the explosion of knowledge, of the knowledge of darkness, which you will not be able to um, um, subdue with that same primitive, you know, a minuscule kind of little light of yours that you're going to let shine. As darkness begins to consume the earth, the Bible instructs us to shine. And for us to shine, the glory has to rise from within us. Now, that glory rising from within us is not just going to be bright light. No, no. It is going to come as an overflow. I was saying before that glory means the image and likeness of God, right? As an overflow of interaction with God's word. And that interaction with God's word is not going to be primitive. It is going to require extensive interaction. The true, I'm, I'm going to emphasize interaction a lot. Because over time, understanding wisdom are the, is the fruit of interaction. There has to be exhaustive interaction with God's word. In every, every single operation of God, we must study God exhaustively. Whether it is the place of singing, whether it's in the place of dancing, whether it's the place of literally reading our Bibles, we are going to continue to interact with God's word with diligence. And I mean this seriously. If we do not do this, Jesus Christ will not be coming back. I've said so many things right now, but let me, let me, I'm so sorry for kind of like scattershotting there. Those who've been with the cave for a while, you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, my concern goes out to those who are new here, who are like, what is he saying? He's saying so many things. Okay. So please forgive me for saying some of these words. Okay. But just to write all these, all these um, things I've just said that don't seem to fit into the, the context of everything I've said so far, put them in a little file in your head called Ron's Files. Okay, just give them your Ron's files. And later on, you can go look them up as the Holy Spirit gives you understanding. Okay, see that I did there? Okay. So um, these, these, um, these, um, these entities, these angels, what they're coming with is not actually God's word per se. Let me, let me, let me paint this for us so you can see, okay? Hallelujah. So I'm going to transition here to our... Um, MSOP. Back to, I'm going to show you a portion of scripture here. Revelation chapter 5. Okay. I'm going to seemingly start from verse 1, but I'm not going to start from verse 1. <laughs> I have a different portion of scripture to show y'all. Oh dear. I should have, yeah, windowed. There we go. Cool. Okay. So let me move this. Up. Okay, cool. Let's start from verse um, da, da, da. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's start from verse 8. Okay. So when he had taken the scroll, excuse me, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down. Okay. So after Jesus Christ took the scroll, there is a response from the creatures in the, in the heavens. Okay. These are the creatures identified as the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They fell down before the land, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense. So they're, notice what's happening here, okay? They're holding harps and golden bowls full of incense. Isn't that interesting? You're going to see these, these items, these tokens later on in the book of Revelation. Now, keep an eye out on them, okay? Because you're going to see them popping up at different points in Scripture, okay? So a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Isn't that interesting? So they are holding the prayers of the saints. Why are the angels holding the prayers of the saints? Okay. You know, when, when we hear this, there's many conclusions we can come to. I want to present one that I think would help us understand the book of Revelation a little bit more, at least in the, pers the perspective that God has given me over time. And this is that these creatures are holding the things that belong to us. These entities 
These harps they're holding, they belong to us. These bowls of incense, they belong to us. And the prayer of the saints is actually our prayer. And I know this because when we keep on reading, look at what, look at what they say. The Bible says they sang a new song. The new song is not meant to be sung by angels. It's meant to be sang by us, right? We're the ones meant to sing the new song. If you're unfamiliar with all of this, I want to encourage you to just pause or bookmark this video, all right? And be, just use a cross-reference. There's an application called the Blue Letter Bible. It's available on Android. There's another application called the Holy Bible by Paul Avery. Download the study tools on that application, okay? And it costs a dollar. And on all of these verses, tap on the cross-references button, and then you would see that each of these scriptures throughout the book of Revelation, they are actually plugs for Old Testament scriptures. If you try reading Revelation without that context, you are going to arrive at very silly conclusions. That is the truth. And the conclusions have would, would you stray so far away from the plan of God for your life, you're going to have to artificially say, and this is what God is doing now, okay? Without anything that looks like any lost plans. As you, um, as you embrace what the scripture is saying, all right, from Genesis to Revelation, the entire way through, old and new, without believing that there's some brand new thing coming up, as you embrace everything as one cohesive, harmonic work spread out over thousands of years, the only spirit of God could sculpt and, and, and fashion, right? Embracing all of this is going to do something for you, okay? You're going to see the simplicity of the gospel. It is actually very, very simple. Yes, because someone has a simple agenda doesn't mean that the execution is going to be simple. For example, someone could say, I want to be president of Nigeria. That sounds lovely. That sounds good. And when I am president, Nigeria is going to be good. That sounds lovely. That sounds, that sounds wonderful, right? It's a very simple picture in your head. Now, when you actually try executing that, you are going to hit a lot of complexity. Because when the rubber hits the road, you're going to go from just you know, these one line phrases and these, you know, um, epic quotes and these shareable, you know, graphics or whatever. Now you have to do the dirty work. Now you now you have to roll up your sleeves. And when that happens, if you have if you don't have the training, the skill, the expertise, the wisdom to execute that simple thing, there will be no simplicity, my dear friend. There is going to be an abandonment of that original <laughs> concept, idea, whatever it was you had in mind of becoming president or I'm sure you understand what I'm saying, right? Very easy at conception, right? But the actual place that God wants us to come to is a place of grasp. The scriptures speak about something called might, right? Strength, right? In laying hold on God's word. Not just laying hold on the words per se, but the reality, the substance of it. It requires training, requires expertise, skill, prudence. Amen? I'm saying all these things because um, um, that simplicity is still going to require wisdom okay okay so moving right along um um they sang a new song you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals okay for you were slain and you have redeemed us to god by your blood let me ask you a question who was redeemed to god by his blood now someone could accurately say all of creation was redeemed to god by his blood i totally agree but the subject matter of the book of revelation is not the redemption at least at this point in time or whatever it's not the redemption of the angelic because those are people that are seemingly are saying this, okay? What is happening here is that you are hearing, all right? You're seeing many things happening, okay? They were, let's read, let's read this, okay? Let's look at this, okay? The angels, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, they had a harp, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and a new song. Now, the contents of the new song was now released. Now, it wasn't that they had the new song per se. And I'm going to show this to us later on, okay? Because the new song, no one can sing it except for those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. But what's happening is that this work of redemption, okay, is meant to be administered into our realities, into our consciousness, into our experience, into our souls, okay, through these creatures. Now, when we see them bringing, okay, the thing that will unlock that new song that Christ has given us the privilege of singing, prophetically, we will see them coming with a new song. It's kind of like what happens with angels when, when with visions and dreams. When, um, someone sees a vision and you see an angel coming with a first aid kit. Do you think the angel actually has a first aid kit? Do you really think the angel is coming with a first aid kit? No. 
The angel has an operation of God that when an operation is released on you, is going to bring about healing, right? We see an angel holding a sword. Do you think an angel is really, do you think anyone in heaven is really holding a sword? The answer is no. There is a working of God, right? That this angel has stewardship over, that they're going to administer. Most of these things that angels have, they're not augmentations to them. They are them. Like when you see the Bible, like you see um, in, in scriptures about um, angels with weapons or whatever. There is no external entity that they are holding or whatever. No, the angel itself is a sword. Does all this make sense? The angel itself is that tool. The operations it has custody of, it bears a measure of the name of God. You see places where the Bible will say things like, I put my name in that angel. That's speaking about a specific operation of God that angel has authority over. With that name inside that angel, that angel is the sword. It is the knife. It is the bow and the arrow. It is the bomb. Amen? It is the first aid kit. But to understand what it is doing to us, it shows us the, this, these picture, prophetic pictures that we can understand. Does all this make sense? So I'm saying all this because when that angel comes and puts the first aid kit or, or uses the sword and you see the angel cutting off the demon head, the head of the demon that's been tormenting you, what has really <laughs> happened there? Was any demon's head actually cut off? <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know what I'm saying here. No, they ended a cycle of darkness in someone's life, right? We, we, have to, we have to be more technical in our understanding of spiritual operations. So one said is it's because we're trying to be deep. How, you're going to be left in the dust, honestly speaking, if you will settle for a primitive understanding of God's operations. Please do not be that child of God that you want to be in the year 1846 when the workings of God just being able to declare these things is not the end, though. We have to steward them actively. These things I'm talking about here, the operations of God, we are going to act actively practice and exercise. See, when Jesus Christ teaching his disciples how to walk in the power of God or how to live like he did, you will see that Jesus Christ taught his disciples how to function in the miraculous. He will give them exercises. Go and, go and preach the gospel. Don't take any money. Don't take any money. What is he doing? He is training them to expose them to the supernatural. They will need to know the rudiments of these things. He will tell them, Master, why can we do it? Because, you, okay, you need to fast and pray for this one. Ah, you didn't have faith here. Oh, my goodness, this is this. What, what is, what's happening here? He's training them. We have to be trained to function and engage with the operations of God. And the operations of God are not limited to just supernatural powers as we know them. The character of God, you have to be trained in that too. Because God's character requires supernatural intervention. That's the truth. To walk in forgiveness... When, if, when, when an offense is overwhelming, you need God's power to, to, to help you out. I don't even understand what I'm saying here. So moving right along, um, 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 when you see the angels, okay, and they are singing as it were a new song, okay, I like how, uh, let me, let me, let me, um, let me see here. Ah, I am using... For some reason, it's another, another version of Pro Presenter Opus. I can't change my translation, but no, that's fine. Okay. Redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Who is going to reign on the earth? Is it the angels? <laughs> Hallelujah. It is humanity, beloved. Humanity. So you're seeing the, these angels, you know, um, um, these angels here. Speaking words that look like what humans should be saying. No, no, no. What's happening? Here? You're, you're seeing there that these angels, they're doing what I need to be doing. I need to meet with them so I can do what they're doing. Does that make sense? It's like you're seeing where you want to go to, and you see someone doing that. Oh, I need to go to him so I can do that thing that God has shown me. I'm, I'm supposed to sing the song of the redeemed. This guy sings the song of the redeemed. I need to meet with him. And that's actually what happens. If you read the very next chapter, these entities, the cherubim, okay, they begin as the seals are being unlocked. They begin to show, right, the workings of God, the inner workings of God, and they manifest violently as things like famine and, and, and wars and what is it? I don't, I don't think these are external occurrences. Honestly, these are personal operations within you where um, the operations of Satan and darkness are fought exhaustively by the workings of God, but that's a different day. Uh, we'll talk about it on a different day, but Revelation chapter 14 I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him were a hundred and forty four thousand each having their father's name written on their forehead. So they had received the operations of God. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters 
and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. Isn't that interesting? I wonder where we saw that, huh? Harpists playing their harps, okay? And these harpists sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. I wonder where that new song came from, huh? What does that mean? The impartation that the angels carried in chapter 5 had been expressly communicated to the sons and daughters of God. Can we see that? So now the angels could no longer sing it because they never were singing it. Amen. What was happening was that they were prophetically what you were seeing was, oh, for me to sing the new song, I need to interact with the cherubim, with the morning stars. Okay. Before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. No one could, no one could, I'm going to say it again. No one, no one, no one could not even sing it. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who are redeemed from the earth. So it is impossible for the cherubim to sing, to sing the new song. Is everyone listening? So what is happening here? We see that the cherubim prophetically are singing the song prophetically in a shadow. To do what? To beckon humanity. Do you want to do what we are doing? Or this is what you should be doing. Come and meet us. We will help you unlock that functionality on the inside of you. It's kind of like the basketball coach that um, never got to pass vars high school varsity. But he has this dream in his heart of blah, 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 blah. So he sees a young boy and he sees this boy has the talent, the gift, the potential to do what he could not accomplish. So what does he do? He begins to train the boy. Come on, boy. Let me show you how it's done. Let me, let me. And what's happening? He begins to raise up this boy so that he can do what he cannot do. That's what the cherubim are doing. The Bible says that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different than, than a slave. And he's put under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the father. And that's what happened to Adam. The cherubim, when they see Adam, oh, they're looking at, oh my gosh, he has so much potential. He can look like God. Oh my goodness, this thing I have that God gave me is for him. If I, if I meet with this young boy, he could discover how to walk in the healing gift. Another angel is like, oh my goodness, what I'm carrying. If it, if it is released on this young man, he could walk in the wisdom of God. And this lady, oh my goodness, I have something here. If I minister to this young girl, she's going to become an intercessor. She's going to walk in the love of God. Now, that angel, when an angel appears, okay, the angel could appear in many forms. But one form an angel could appear in is, for example, the child, the young, young girl who's walking around in, 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 um, in Eden, for example, okay, would see this angel weeping. And get, it goes to the angel, why are you crying? Because people need to be saved. God wants to save people. I see the angel crying. Oh, my goodness, how can I help? And the angel touches the girl and now releases the operation of God that that angel is framed with, that name of God on that angel, into the girl. And when the, that girl receives that operation of God, the girl begins to weep. I don't know if you're seeing the picture there. The angel can't actually intercede for anyone. Amen? But the angel is showing something. This is what you want to be. Come, I can show you. Isn't that what the devil did with Adam and Eve? When he said to them, you be as gods, knowing good and evil. That is what all the angels were telling Adam and Eve. Come with me. I will show you how you can be like God. And the portions, the operation that they had on the inside of them, they would then release them upon Adam and Eve. And the end goal is that Adam and Eve will now become those things that these operations of the angel, these angels, right, um, have unlocked. I hope all of this makes sense. Is this too complex? Is this too hard? I hope it is in the comment section is there. You can comment, you can complain, you can, you can whine and, gro and gro groan too. But I hope you understand. So this is what the Garden of Eden was. The Garden of Eden, all right, was not necessarily a place, but an estate of being where Adam had access to all of the morning stars, including the one that was dead. Amen? And all of these morning stars, they had res the responsibility of stewarding, all right, the word of God from which operations of God will spring from. And we know this because if you study the tabernacle, you see that surrounding the Ten Commandments are cherubim, right? So surrounding every revelation of God's word, the morning stars, they're like, 
bees, they beehive. They, they just whiz around the nectar of God's word. Hallelujah. So Adam would go to each of these entities and they will begin to unlock inside of him, right? The, I'm using, I'm, explain, I'm using Adam to explain New Testament process for us. That's not exactly what happens, but we'll get to that later on. Unlock inside of him that image and likeness of God. They would do exactly what Lucifer did to Adam and Eve, except they would kill you at the end. Because what happened was that when Satan released his operation upon Adam and Eve, like God warned them, they died. They experienced separation from God. And what the angels, what their operations are meant to, were meant to do is that in community with humanity, these operations would unlock instead of humanity, all right, measures of likeness. Hallelujah. Now, as these things are being unlocked, what would happen, all right, is that humanity would begin to look like God. Now, these things that these angels are unlocking is just the revelation of the word of God. I'm going to say it again. What these creatures are unlocking is the revelation of the word of God. The obsession of the angels of God is the unveiling of God's word. The obsession of all of creation is the unveiling of God's word. The purpose, hallelujah. Bible says these guys are ministers to us who are heirs of salvation, and they desire to look. In. Let's just go there. First Peter chapter one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let us start from verse three. Yes. Cool. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you are grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hallelujah. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Now, these prophets in Hebrews chapter, uh oh, okay, let's go back. Come on. There we go. This salvation in Hebrews chapter one, the Bible says, um, God at various times in diverse manners, okay, um, spoke in times past through his servants, the prophets. Okay, so we're seeing here that when God spoke his word to them, okay, Bible says it was salvation that was being revealed to them. Salvation here is Jesus, okay? Of this salvation of the word of God that was revealed to them, okay? They inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that will come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed. That not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. So these things that angels um, desire to look into, they, look, they want to look into the mystery of how what they minister to us mixes with God has, what God has already put on the inside of us. And unlocks the inheritance of the saints. Unlocks the heritage of God. So that we can freely. Now we already have free access to it. okay? But freely as in laying hold of it. For lack of better words. If that makes sense. Amen. Now all of this. The tool. The nexus point of all of these things I just said now. Is God's word. That is what the morning stars 
are concerned with. And, you know, I can show this to you again later on in Second Peter chapter 1. The Bible says you do well to give heed to the prophetic word as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Amen? So basically, the Bible is saying over and over and over and over and over again, all right, that God's word is the tool. In fact, dare I say that the Garden of Eden is not nothing more than plantations, right? Little forests of God's word, the speakings of God laid out, almost like God of Eden, think of it like an institution for man to digest, right? To receive God's word. Hallelujah. So when you see the parable of the sower, you have a, a closer picture, right, of what the Garden of Eden was. It wasn't really a forest, right? What was it? The volume of the books, the book of life. Is everyone listening? The Garden of Eden was the archive, the transcript of the will of God. The Garden of Eden is the place of pleasure, right? And where are the pleasures of God found? At his right hand. Where is Jesus seated right now? The Garden of Eden was the curriculum of Jesus Christ. I don't know if anyone here understands. This is not Zoom. That's making sense. Not complex, but the young believer would require a lot of tutoring. Yes, yes, yes. All of these things would require that you are exposed to a little bit more than what is um, popular in the body of Christ. You have to go beyond Genesis, um, Jeremiah 29, 11, understanding of scripture alone, right? And you have to be able to, there's those other places in the Bible that we have to, we have to spend time in, amen? So when you study and you see in the scriptures that, um, Oh, no, I hope I didn't lose my train of thought. Come on, come on, come on. What was I talking about just now? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. So man, yes, will be going through stages of development, okay, en route, okay, to looking like Jesus. And the tool that is going to facilitate all of these things is God's word, the unveiling of God's word. And God's word here. The Bible says that God's word, amen, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So that tells me that Jesus Christ, the brightness of God's glory, is God's word becoming flesh. So what was the Garden of Eden for? If the image and likeness of God was for the word becoming flesh, the Garden of Eden was an institution to facilitate the tabernacling, the tangibility of God's word. So all of this makes sense. So God, the, the, the Garden of Eden was a construct, right? Using all these nice terms, okay? I'm trying to add some novelty to the, to the, um, to the picture of the Garden of Eden. You know, I saw this um, at the Bible study with some friends yesterday. And uh, one of my friends, he printed out these charts, beautiful charts. And in one of them, I laughed because they showed the city of God, the New Jerusalem, as a cube. And basically, they showed like this giant chair and two trees and Basically, like, um, I know it's a caricature, I know it's, it's just an illustration, but it's just so funny how we can see that and a stronghold is formed in our mind that this is what God's, God's, the city of God looks like. It looks like a box or a jewel city. Hallelujah. <laughs> I want to propose to you that the civilization of God is more sophisticated than that. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something, okay? Anything you can see in a movie is a joke compared to what God is capable of. I just need, I need us to understand that. So if, if we as believers, okay, we, we think in our minds that God's, God's, God's city amen, is literally a cube in the sky made of gold. Hallelujah. We are joking. We have no idea who God is because that thing can be sculpted without, that, that cannot be the civilization of God. God doesn't need an edifice for crying out loud. God doesn't need, can I say something? Creation is the tabernacle of God. Amen? You know, if you study the scriptures very carefully, you discover that creation, I'm explaining this time and time again, okay? Let me, let me show you a portion of the scripture that would paint this clearly. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. 
Bible says here, the 24 elders, they said, um, they bowed down, they worship God and said this, okay, you are worthy to receive Oh, this doesn't, ah, I can't change my translation in this Bible application. Ah, darn it. But just believe what I'm about to say, okay? Now, they say here in the New King James, okay, this New King James, it says here, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. I want to propose to you that uh, what the King James says, where it says, they exist for your pleasure. The creation exists for your pleasure, okay? Now, we know the pleasure of God is Jesus, right? And we explain that Eden, which means bliss and pleasure, right? We explain that Eden is a transcript of Jesus Christ, right? An institution of Christ, where anyone that enters into Eden on the, on the way out, not on the way out of Eden, but as a consequence of, you know, completing that journey, that, um, that um, voyage, that um, the course of Eden, basically, Christ comes out. Does that make sense? Oh, and again, not comes out, but you get the idea. So that tells us something, okay? That um, the Garden of Eden, okay? It says, that's, that's what Christ says, okay? So whenever we see pleasure in the Bible, we're thinking about the image and likeness of God. We're thinking about Jesus, right? So when the Bible says he made all things for his pleasure, what are we saying here? All things were made for Jesus, for the image and likeness of God. Let's keep this going, okay? Because if you read the book of Colossians chapter 1, I think I have a, yes, I have a Bible app here. Bible says here, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Let's start from verse 14. Start from verse 15. Okay. Huh. I am, there we go. Let's start from 14, sorry. Okay. In Christ, in him we have, in whom we have an through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, Okay, this is Colossians chapter 1. We are currently reading from verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Hallelujah. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. Now, when you read firstborn over all creation, many people have thought that this meant that Jesus Christ was the first creation of God. That is not true. The firstborn... Amen. And the father, maybe understanding some Jewish culture would help with what this means. Okay. So in Jewish culture, who's, I'm sure everyone here has heard about the double portion before, right? Double portion, the Elisha thing, right? Give me the double portion of your spirit. Hallelujah. The double portion in the scriptures, okay, is not that you're going to get twice of what your dad has. That is impossible because your dad can only give you what he has, right? So I explain what happens. Okay. So in the Jewish culture, when a dad is about to commit his inheritance to his seed, what happens is that he brings all of his children. He lines all of them up, okay? And then what he does is that he divides um, the inheritance evenly among his children and himself. I'm going to say that again. The father lines up all his children from the oldest to the least, and then he divides his inheritance among all of the children and himself. So let's say this man had three children he is going to divide his inheritance into four parts. Does that make sense? If he had five children, he's going to divide his inheritance into six parts because he himself now, right, is the extra child. So five children, he is also another person. And so he divides his inheritance into six parts, okay? Now what happens is that the father now gives one, in, one part to each of his children, but then the firstborn now gets his portion and the firstborn gets the firstborn's portion. And the firstborn also gets the father's portion. When you put those two together, you get what is called the double portion. Does all this make sense? Why is this important? Because the firstborn has now received the portion of his father. Does that make sense? In other words, the firstborn is the one that gave, for lack of better words, he is now the father of his siblings. Does all this make sense? So in the Bible, they say Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation. To the Jewish mind, okay? Now, someone would say, this was written to the Gentiles. The, 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 the book of Colossians was written to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. <laughs> yes, very true. But if you check how Paul taught, okay, the Gentiles, he taught the Gentiles from the Jewish scriptures. And the Jewish scriptures must be understood in the context of the Jewish culture. So Paul, when he speaks about things like adoption, 
okay? When we speak about things like being a son, right? Weos, okay? All these Greek words. They were not, um, they were not taught without an understanding of the Jewish culture. No. That's the major problem we have in, in, um, in our current day narrative where we are, we're trying to understand the scriptures, abandoning the context of the Jewish culture, abandoning the context of the original Jewish language and even the Greek language at different points in time. Okay, And by abandoning these things, we lose the context necessary for understanding what is being communicated to us. So all this makes sense? Without this context, you will not understand what the Bible is saying. You get the main gist, Jesus Christ loves you and he died. Why did he have to die? You, from that point, why did he have to die? You need the Jewish culture. You need to understand Passover, right? You need to understand the sacrifice of the lamb. You need to understand rituals. You can't just take the gospel. You, you don't understand what is happening if you don't understand the Jew. We can, you know, we can retell it, right? You can retell the Jewish culture in different ways. Oh, the wages of sin is death, and this and this and this. All of these things are intrinsic in the Jewish culture. It was understood. That when someone rebels against God, they should be put to death. It's in their culture. So they understand the reason why someone would have to die for sin. Does all this make sense? Without that context, we have to start cracking our heads. Hey, God. Hey, God. Hey, God. Hey, God. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's funny. Amen. So I'm moving all, all along so, um, so I can say all this, okay? That's what double portion is. So when you hear firstborn, think about paternity. Think about being a prototype or the originator or the template or the one that gives the other children their image and their likeness or their inheritance. Does that make sense? So Christ is the what? The father over all creation. Now we know this because the very next verse says, for by him, all things were created. That would not make any sense if they said he was the first creation of God. So he is the first creation of God, for by him were all things created. That doesn't make any sense. But if he said he is the father of creation, for by him all things were created. Now it makes sense. Can we see how these two verses make more sense now? I hope my words are being understood. Being the first one over all creation here means that Jesus Christ is the originator, right? The father, the template of creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Hallelujah. So when we say all things were made for his pleasure, there's a new dimension here. It looks like all things were made or patterned after Christ Jesus. Can everyone see that? So all of creation... <laughs> is meant to be passed. And you can even see this. Let me just look at this, okay? So James chapter 1. Let me show this another verse of scripture here. James chapter 1 from verse, uh, let's see, when he speaks about God being the father of lights. From verse 17. Let's read this, okay? Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. So we are meant to be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. That word first fruit and the word for firstborn are almost synonymous, meaning that we are also meant to be a prototype of creation. Hallelujah. Why am I saying all of these things? Because the earth, the planet, creation, all of the inhabitants, they are meant to be a replica of the image and likeness of God. So creation is actually an ongoing revelation of who God is. That's what creation is. Now, what God has decided to do is that to steward that operation of revealing who God is, there's going to be a tour guide. Except this tour guide is not going to be showing creation who God is. It's kind of like you're showing God who he is by showing... Anyways, it gets really interesting after a while. <laughs> but basically what's happening is that we as a tour guide, we're not going to be showing who God is by just pointing to God. We're going to be showing who God is by creating who God is in creation. 
so it says, where is this in the Bible? Hallelujah. You see, the first few days of creation, when they were finished, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This is after six days of creating. Now, if you want to make someone that looks like you and functions like you, what do you think they're going to be doing? They're going to be doing what you've been doing, right? And what has God been doing for the past six days? He has been creating, calling light out of darkness. So what do you think humanity should be doing in the ages to come? We should be doing what? Calling more light out of darkness. Continuing the work of creation, which we have shown is the revelation of God. Now, the difference is that now creation is not just going to be unveiled directly by God, but directly by us, where we now take on the role of the entire Godhead of, first of all, embodying the image and likeness of God as the first fruits of all of creation. And as the first fruits, we now instruct creation to look like us because now we are the governors of creation. Oh, this makes sense. We become the visible image of God, all right? That we are now going to instruct creation to resemble. That's why God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and then subdue. Amen? The heart and vision of God is that all things, right? We're going to be the makers of all things. By all things here, we're making reference to the fullness of the likeness of God. When the Bible says all things, we're not just speaking about everything. There's many things that right now exist, but they're not visible, even in the heavenlies. In the heavenlies, they're invisible realms. In the heavenlies, they're invisible realms on the earth. Okay? So there's things in heaven that are invisible. The things on the earth are invisible. We read that in Colossians, right? That he is the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created, whether they be visible and invisible. Colossians, one thing, verse, verse 17, though. No. Let's start from verse um, was it 14. Yeah, let's start from verse 14. Let's start from verse 15. Hallelujah. Um, please, this is, this is not us trying to be deep. Amen? I'll explain why this is not us being deep. Because if you read this portion of scripture here, you're speaking to the Colossian church. These things are not written to deep people. This was written to the church, the entire body. Please, <laughs> Hallelujah. We have to stop giving excuses. Someone says, I'm not giving... Can I say something? It is go There's going to be people that have propensities for things in the body. So you're going to find people that they have this affinity for. I just love singing to God. That does not mean, all right, that you're the only one that should be singing to God. Someone says, I just love it, you know, preaching the gospel. I just have this burden for souls. That does not mean you should be the only one that should be preaching the gospel. Someone says, I just love the deep things of God. That does not mean you should be the only one learning and discovering the deep things of God. Someone says, I just want to live like Jesus. I I'm sure you're getting the picture, right? The fullness of the Godhead is what we are meant to embody. Everyone in the body. Someone says, but people are going to have unique expressions. Absolutely. We're all going to have unique expressions of Christ. Absolutely. And these unique expressions of Christ are unique to each individual. Well, make no mistake. The same genes are going to be running through all of our veins. The same blood. In fact, we're actually going to be sharing the very same, you know, if you study the scriptures very carefully. And you see what God has called us to receive. If you study 1 Corinthians chapter 2, okay, as concerning our inheritance in Christ, you discover that the Bible explains that when God gave us his spirit, he gave us his deep things. When a spirit enters someone, that spirit comes, when it enters someone, when someone's spirit, as in your, not the Holy Spirit's resting upon you. I'm talking about, talking about the spirit of God that's inside of you, as in the new man, that new creation man, Christ in you, right? That, new, that, that spirit of God. That you are now, right? Okay. Amen. This is not blasphemy. It's in the Bible, right? Your spirit, you're a spirit. You have a soul, you live in a body, right? Your spirit right now is Christ, right? That spirit is who? Is Christ. It is not baby Christ. And I explained to my siblings um, yesterday. There is no baby Christ. Like when people say things like, you know, I'm just trying to energize my spirit. You are not actually energizing your spirit. Or I'm, I'm going to feed my spirit. You cannot feed your spirit. Your spirit is God. Please, this is not blasphemy. This is not, this is not 
weird. Your spirit is who? God. Bible says he that is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. One spirit with him. So let me ask you a question. Can you feed God? Can you energize God? Can you, can you, your, can your spirit be asleep? The answer is no. No, what we refer to as our spirits being energized is our soul. That place where our souls interface with our spirits, right? That synapses, those, those synapses, there, those connections, we have not exercised our souls in establishing that connection. So what's happening here is that when the soul, right, when our will, we want to release or manifest or give expression to something in God, that synapses has not been thoroughly exercised. It's kind of like when a child is learning how to walk. It takes a while for the child to fully establish that relationship between the child's legs, right, and the rest of their body. It is a synergy, a harmony the child has to come into before the child can learn balance, right? As a child tries standing, there's so many nerves firing at the same time. It takes a lot of firing of nerves repeatedly before what the child is able to get a grip and stand. And what do we do? Yay! You're standing! That is actually what we, as the body of Christ, are meant to come into. As we continue to traffic, right, engage with the Christ that we are, we're going to find what? Dendrites, right? Synapses. I'm making reference to like nerve cells, right? We're going to find connections, right? And we know this is true because the Bible explains that when we pray in an unknown tongue, our understanding is unfruitful. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, all right, is your spirit man that's praying. Your spirit man is not a baby Jesus. He's not Christ that is growing. He's not a, 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 a fetus Jesus. Absolutely not. So he's the one that raised God raised from the dead. The person inside of you is in the ages to come right now. The person inside of you is eternal. He has always existed. As I'm saying these things to you, I'm describing who God says you are. Okay. That entity that you are, hallelujah, you haven't, you, your consciousness doesn't have you, you, you hasn't borne the, the registers yet of that person's reality. Now, I'm saying all these things because that spirit man, all right, that you have inside of you, he knows who you are. The Bible says no man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man. So the spirit that is inside of us, he knows who we are. Now... The Bible now explains that we have not received the spirits of this world, but we have the spirit which is of God. They're speaking about the Holy Spirit now, okay? Not just, not just, spirit, spirit, um, not just our spirit man, okay? But even the Holy Spirit has given to us, okay? That we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. The Holy Spirit has a soul. And the Holy Spirit has a body. <gasps> yes, the Holy Ghost is not a ghost. <laughs> amen he's not just a spirit no, no no the holy spirit is a spirit he has a soul amen he has a body also now don't don't uh, don't be frightened jesus christ is a spirit he has a soul and jesus christ lives in a body god the father is a spirit he has a soul he also lives in a body we think that physical that physical bodies are the only bodies that exist but the bible tells us that there are bodies terrestrial and there are bodies celestial it's in the scriptures Amen. Okay. So there are angelic bodies. Those bodies are bodies. Angels are not ghosts. Amen. Hallelujah. They're not floating without the only entities that do not have bodies, quote and unquote and unquote, are human beings that have died. And they only died because of sin and corruption. Nothing was meant to die from the very beginning. Death is something that's very alien. You know, people say things like, you know, from the very beginning, that God's vision was that we'll die and then go and be in heaven with Jesus. That was never the plan. There was no plan about being in heaven with Jesus forever. That was never the plan. It will never be the plan, to be honest with you. you. Check your Bible and read your Bible very carefully. You see that the plan of God is that we live here on the earth with God, that God comes here to the earth. God is manifested through us here on the earth. So there's no dying and going to be with heaven with Jesus. That is not, that is not in the Bible as God's plan. That is nowhere in God's plan, okay? Now, what happened was that when people died, or when people die, which should not be happening, their, 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 their souls gravitate, right, towards wherever, whatever life their spirit has. If you're a child of Satan, you go to hell. That is, that is actually, it's not like you're going to hell. You're already in hell. That's the truth. 
Because when someone is dead spiritually, you are separated from God. You're, you're in hell. You're world spirit with Satan. That's the truth. Now, when, when you are born again, you are seated where? In heavenly places where? In Christ Jesus. You don't, you're already there. Does that make sense? It's just that your soul now begins to what? Travel in that direction. Does that make sense? Your soul now appears in that place. Maybe who have shared their death experience or different things or whatever. Let me tell you something, okay? If you are not born again right now, you are in hell. Irrespective of your soul's experiences, you are in hell. Just like right now, if you are born again, you are in heaven. doesn't matter whether you feel it or not. It has nothing to do with how you feel. How do I know this? Because the Bible explains to us that it's your spirit that knows who you are <laughs> and what is inside of you, not your soul. Now, your spirit knows who you are, but then he wants to reveal. The Bible says... God has revealed these things to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So us receiving the Holy Ghost is for the intention of discovering who we are. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. So when we receive the new life of God, we receive God's internals, the deep things of God. I'm going to say that again. When we receive the life of God, when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we got born again, when we receive the new man, the new man, we received the very life of God. Now, when we receive that life of God, the Spirit of God is now has an objective, all right? And this objective, he manifests through wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord has the assignment of establishing what? Contact that you would discover the riches of the heritage inside of you. Hmm. For this reason, when you're praying in the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, the Bible says your spirit man is praying, but your understanding, your soul is unfruitful. You know the reason why? A lack of exercise. A lack of practice. Your soul has no idea why your spirit man is speaking to God, the Bible says. The Bible explains that we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And the Bible says that when you speak in other tongues, you speak mystery. So you are declaring the wisdom of God. What does that mean? You are speaking intelligently. Your spirit man is able to communicate and interact with God intelligently. Now, the Bible explains that your soul is not able to participate in that interaction. Why? The synapsis, right? There's no interface yet. But he that prays in a known tongue, right? Let him pray that he may interpret. So there's a heart posture that you pray with where you're desiring, right, to be a part of the conversation. I want to bear witness to the conversation taking place. I don't know. I do not know what's happening. No, no. I want my soul to participate in this interaction. That's actually how you know what interactions are. That's actually how you experience things, right? Your soul participates in things. So those who participate in things, there's no register of that interaction ever happening. Like, for example, now, when we got born again, the fullness of God came into us. Because our soul has no register of any of those actions, we have to be told what happened to us when we got born again from the scriptures. That, oh, wait, you don't have any records of becoming like Jesus. Let me explain to you who you are in Christ. The Bible says... That God has given us the Spirit of God that we might know all things that have been freely given to us. We have been given the fullness of the likeness of Jesus. Hallelujah. So when we received this beautiful life of God, along with that came the innards, the inners of God. Why am I saying this? The deep things of a man speaks about the things in the heart of a man. By the heart of him, and I mean man's, the stem, the entire stem of the consciousness of a human being. So when we received the life of God, we received God's consciousness. We received God's subconsciousness. And we received God's unconsciousness. What am I saying here? <laughs> God through Jesus Christ, is willing to share his own consciousness with us. That's how serious God is about sharing, about love. 
God is not, God is not scared about you usurping authority. In fact, he's saying, come and experience being me. Not that I'll leave being me and then you come and take over me. Come and experience with me. Be, be, as if enter inside of me and become like me. Is that what the scriptures say? That will be one, right? Us in God, God in us, and we in Jesus, and God, Holy Ghost in us, and everyone in everyone, and every, everyone inside everyone. Amen? What is happening here, we are sharing consciousness. So now when God is about to say something, you are a part of it. Who knows what I'm saying? When God wakes up from sleep, you are waking up from sleep. When God turns his head, you are turning your head. So when people look at you, when people are looking at God, they're looking at you. When people look at you, they're looking at God. Who knows what I'm saying? This is the intensity of what God wants to give us. So when God said, let's make man in our image after our likeness, God was not just saying, let's, make, let's give man two eyes and a nose and, and a mouth. Oh, 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 no. No, beloved. God wants us to bear his image and his likeness. John calls this thing the fellowship. Let's just read that, okay? And we can see the reason why God's word is at the forefront of everything. First John, oh, I think we'll end with this. I'm saying all of these things, okay, to show the reason why an emphasis on God's word is what we're kind of cap capping at here. I can also share about Melchizedek, you know, the master of righteousness, the word of righteousness, amen, and be dull of hearing and how God's word brings you to perfection. And we shared that before. I'm just sharing this in a different light. Hallelujah. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, okay? With our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness. Now, when you read this thing, many people have said that, oh, this is Jesus, as in the man Jesus, that they touched him and they held him. The best argument for that would be that, okay, when he was raised from the dead, that they touched him. That's the best argument can give here. But that's, I don't believe that's what this, the scripture is saying, okay? What this scripture is saying here, okay, is that that thing that God promised of the life of God, he says, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness. What John is describing here, okay, is that the life of God was exposed to them and synapses, there was interfacing, there was the channels, right? The, the gateways of the heart, the thrones of the soul, their spiritual senses bore record of this life inside of them. Now, the life was manifested. Oh, dear. Jumped way too far here. Go back to work for now. There we go. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and we now bear witness. We have the records of the life. Why is this important? Because the Bible explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the Spirit of God, sorry, Romans chapter 8, the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. So the Spirit of God bears the witness of who we are. Now we have to bear that witness. We have to bear that record. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we're able to give expression to things that we have record of. That's what Paul, you know, um, typifies in Philemon chapter 1 verse 6 when he says, the acknowledging of your faith or the communication of your faith, the expression of your faith, the substance of that which you're, which you're interacting with, <clears throat> the evidence of things that are unseen, that, the, that thing is able, can, be, can be communicated, can be expressed, can be declared, can be revealed to others. That's what, that's what um, communication means, okay? You're showing people other things, um, something that you're seeing, okay? You can show people what you are seeing, and by other people, I mean creation. You're able to express what you're interacting with by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Okay? All right. <sighs> the life was manifested. We have seen and we bear witness. We bear record and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us, or let me say it like this: We declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. What is he talking about? The life of God, the inwards of God. Let's keep this going, okay? 
that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What is John speaking of here? He is lost inside of God. What does it mean that you're just in love with God, just love, just love God? There's that, that is part of the process, but there is a place where your consciousness and God's consciousness, there's no seam between them. Where you have fully borne the register, you borne witness to the life of God. The consequence of this is that God's consciousness invades your soul as your soul invades his consciousness. Because of this, God sees you as part of himself as you see God as a part of him. Now, God already sees you this way, but I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There was a way I spoke as a child, right? I thought as a child, I understood as a child, right? But then when that which is perfect has come, or he starts first of all with, sorry, now I become a man, right? And I put away childish things. Hallelujah. Now he goes on to say something, okay? Now we see through a glass dimly. What is he saying here? The dendrites, right? The synapses, the interfaces have not fully, what? Have not been fully connected yet, right? I have not fully embraced where I am in Christ yet. That's what Paul said, to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but having the righteousness which is by faith, right? That's a my attain to from the dead. So Paul was saying, we're still seeing through a glass dimly. Now he said, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part to be done away with. And he goes on to say, now I see, in a specific way, he now goes on to say something now, then I will know even as I am known. Let me just go there. So I'm just telling stories. First Corinthians 13, verse 11. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child and I thought as a child. Keep in mind, okay? This is the child now learning how to walk, okay? There was a way you were before you started walking, right? You couldn't walk. All you could do was crawl. And there was a way you moved around, right? Now he's saying something. Why? The best you could do was maybe muster up some strength and kick with your feet, right? But in trying to embrace maturity, I became a man and I put away childish things, right? As a child learns to walk, crawling is now for small boys, right? <laughs> for now we see in a mirror dimly. So what is he speaking about here? Spiritual senses, gateways of the heart, thrones of the soul, right? The gateways to our subconscious, to, to our unconsciousness, right? Okay. We now see dimly, but then, what are we looking at? The mirror, right? So when we are looking at God, what are we looking at? Ourselves. Because we have his life. And as we're looking at him, we're discovering that, wow, I am, my consciousness is inside of yours. So when I'm looking at you, I'm looking at myself. Okay, we'll keep this going. I just want to let, let, show you here how the mind-blowing things of life should not be discovered by unbelievers. The mind-blowing things of life should not be said by unbelievers. Look at, the, look at what we're talking about here, man. Seriously. Do you know that if you obey the assignments of God to meditate on God's word day and night, to engage in scripture, these scriptures, do you know what, do you know, do you know what, the, what, so interacting with God's word is not just meant to, um, I like what someone said about um, mathematics. You're given, people say that, oh, uh, well, they give us all these tough math problems in school, but we're never going to use math in real life, right? And my, my math is not talking about like general mathematics. Of course you use math in real life, but like all the trig functions and all these other things. But there was a guy called Neil, T Neil Grease. Neil, he's a communicator. Neil Tyrone Grease. Neil, yes, Neil DeGrease Tyson. That's his name, yes. Um, science communicator, okay? He said something. Yes, it's true. You might never use these things explicitly in real life, like in your normal day-to-day -day life. But the training that interacting with these things would do to you, it does something to your soul, Right? As you go through school and go through the rigorous testings and trials of your school, your academic career, 
There's things that you have to do, assignments that you have to complete, et cetera, et cetera. As you complete these things and you're finished with them, you break your pencil. I'm never going to do that again. Okay. What that, that training you went through, that exercise you went through, it did something to you. And it's going to make you a better functioning member of society. Because of those, that stress test, because of that training, it's kind of like when someone has finished lifting weights, right? I'm, when I'm in the gym, I'm lifting weights. I'm never going to be in real life lifting a barbell out in real life. That's not what happens in real life, right? But there's going to be other things that are heavy that I need to carry, right? And that training in the gym prepares me for those things. What am I saying here, okay? <laughs> when you interact with God, when you begin to fathom the things that are in scriptures, okay? As you, as you task your mind, right, in obedience to God's word, you to love God's word with all of your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength, right, with all of your faculties, okay? As you task your mind with the responsibility of interacting with God's word, with all of your faculties, all right, you put yourself, it's actually, it requires diligence, that's the truth. You put yourself, right, through a training, a work of training. Now, this training does something to your soul. It's on, 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 on it hinges your mind. It unlocks functionalities on the inside of you. It creates strength. That training births potential inside of you. Without that training, there's some kind of mindset you will not be able to have. You will not be able to conceive some things. What am I saying here? As believers, if we are truly engaging God's word, our mind should be very fruitful. If you are truly praying in the Holy Spirit, your mind, you should be having explosive mindsets because of interaction with the deep things of God. If it is Jesus you are following, you should not be limiting yourself to what is available on this planet. As far as like hopes and dreams are concerned, as far as pursuits of life are concerned, I understand that poverty can be painful and can be traumatizing. But well, so can God. God can be so painful. God can be so traumatizing. God can really blow your mind that because of that, you begin to think in a specific way. We will ask you why. You point to the scriptures as the reason why. Well, so how are you able to carry this heavy thing? Oh, well, because I have big muscles. Where did you get those big muscles from? I went to the gym. Is everyone listening? Isn't that what Daniel said? When they asked him, oh, no one can actually do these things, though. But there's a God in heaven that gives wisdom and might. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's finish this portion of scripture and we end today's book. Is it next school? Hallelujah. For now we see the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. Now abide faith, hope, and love, and these three are great, but the greatest of these is love. Hallelujah. I hope this blessed you, beloved. I hope this encouraged you to discover who you are in Christ. I hope this is pushing you out of the comfort zone of orthodox, traditional, archaic Christianity, where our pastors are laboring in the word and we are doing nothing. I hope this is pressuring you to see that Christ is not the boring person that we have been um, unfortunately led to believe by what looks like millennia of dark ages. I hope you're seeing that the average believer has more in them than can be fathomed. The Bible says now to him is able to do exceedingly abundantly and above all that you can ask or think. We need to interact with God's word. We need to establish contact with who we are in Christ Jesus. And I'm saying this because these realities, it's not about you answering questions, right? Real life is not about you answering questions. Real life is about the training you receive from God's word. When temptations come, they're going to check how much interaction with God's word have you had? Have you broken through in the place of engaging God's word? When sickness comes, when life's issues come, they're asking you the question, just not in the nice formal way, the orthodox way we would want the question to be asked, right? We want the enemy to come and ask us, do you believe in healing? Yes, I believe in healing. Oh, darn it. Nothing we can do. He believes in healing. They're going to ask you that question. How are they going to ask you that question? By sending sickness your way. Do you believe in purity? Yes, I believe in purity. Oh, God, you wanted to attack this person with fornication or pornography. How is anyone going to ask you these questions? By what? For shoving these things down your throat. Hallelujah. Now, we respond 
with righteousness because of what? Because I hear that is born of God. Hallelujah. Cannot sin. So there is, there is a, for lack of better words, as, as believers, we need to lay hold on these realities. The Bible says, those that are there shall not say, I am sick. There are people that have touched these realities in God. There are people that are singing the song of the redeemed. There are people that have received the harp, received the bowl of incense. They have re- they're singing the song of the redeemed. All of us, our redemption in Christ is ours though. But we haven't unlocked it yet. Paul says something that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus said that, not Paul. Well, Paul quoted Jesus. Amen. I must put, I spoke about this yesterday, um, two days ago, sorry, during um, um, open book. Receiving the forgiveness of sins. We need to know that we are free. Many of us don't know we are free from sin right now. I remember like a, a um, a season of my life, the biggest thing that God wanted me to see was that you are my son. You are my son. And at the time I was dealing with something internally and it was so hard because I was seeing what looked like contradictions to what God was saying. Is this how your son is meant to be? And the Lord had to let me know that I am not meant to be. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Many times what you are believing in is going to be contradictory to your circumstances. And just because you believe for five minutes doesn't mean that no, and nothing and doesn't mean that something's going to happen. And just believe because you believe for five minutes and nothing happened visually doesn't mean that nothing is happening. Hallelujah. Remember a, a testimony of a man of God. He was sharing something where he said that um, the Lord showed him how, how um, um, the enemy's game over millennia with human beings is that he discovered something. If we can make them believe that nothing happens when they believe for a short period of time, then we can get them to stop believing. So for lack of better words, Satan endures the pain of the torment that is released when we believe in the word. He endures that pain with the hope that you would quit. So you see why it's called a fight of faith. Who can, who, who really believes truth is that he does, he knows who you are. He knows deep down who you are. He knows who we are. They know who we are. They know we are light. They know that we are gods. I said, I've made you a god to Pharaoh. They know who we are. You can, you can instruct Satan and tell him to fix everything in your life that is wrong. But to do this, I'm telling you the truth. Satan is actually a boss boy for us. The devil, if you check the Bible, the beast is actually going to tear this, the, the, sorry, the people that will tear this world down are actually going to be the kings of the earth. They will beat her up and burn her up with fire. Agents of darkness are meant to serve the plans and purposes of God. When Jesus Christ came to Gadara, the madman of Gadarenes, what did he do? The evil spirits in him, they went to judge wickedness in the land. So people were rearing pigs in Israel. That is an abomination. And what happened? They went to go judge it. I, mean, I think it was Smith Wigglesworth that some evil spirits came and messed up his room. And he said, all of you, clean up this room now. And he went up just to go and sleep and then he came back or he left to go to something and came back and they sorted the room out for him. Hallelujah. We're called to walk in this. Does that mean that there are going to be things that will be weird? How come this is happening to this child, this child of God? How come no, 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 no. As contradictions are coming, I remember something that happened to me yesterday. As it came, I just, I knew, I knew what was happening. I just went deep into my soul. And I said, we are going to fight this battle to the end. Excuse me, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. I said we are going to fight this battle to the end. And I'm going to emerge the winner. What God used to help me was that man's testimony. Because what was happening was I was kicking back and there seemed to be no budging. 
And I was wondering, is it that I've grown weary? You know, that's what the enemy, it's not as I think those thoughts, the enemy projects those thoughts into our mind. And I remember what that man said, the enemy is playing a game with you. He wants you to think nothing is happening. Stay there until you see it manifest. Oh, my dear. It was so funny. As soon as I made up my mind, <laughs> it's like they almost know when you have said, we're going to die here today. <laughs> as soon as I made my mind, I just sunk back deep again. Hallelujah. Okay, I sunk back deep again. And as soon as um, that verdict was released, <laughs> the evil spirit packed up his load and went. We are God's. And children of the Most High. And we will not perish like men. Hallelujah. Hope this blesses you. We are priests of the order of Melchizedek. I'm going to read, sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, Revelation chapter 5. Read the new song. Hallelujah. I'm going to end with that. Uh, Revelation 5. They sang as it were a new song. This is verse um, 6. 4. Uh, three, yes. Use that to end everything as we pray. Communion. That's right. That's right. Uh-oh. Sorry. Verse two. Interesting. Is it that? No. I'm up on the top. There we go. That's why. Ah, there we go. That's why I was like wondering what on earth. So this is verse eight. Aha. Verse nine, the new song. Okay. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. For you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. I'm going to repeat that again. We shall reign on the earth. I'm going to say that again one more time. We shall reign, not in heaven. Yes, we're going to rule in heaven also, right? Because, amen. But the place of warfare. <laughs> The place to see where you are going to be resisted is not in heaven. In heaven, they'll gladly give it to you, right? <laughs> it is here on this earth. Let us see who you think who you think you. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is here on the earth that we're meant to exercise our victory over darkness. It is in hell Jesus Christ showed his victory over darkness. Hallelujah. It was here on earth Jesus Christ came to die. Hallelujah. I'm taking the elements right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you for your sacrifice. Let me take the sacrament. Hallelujah. Uh-oh. Wonderful. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to thank you so much for joining us, beloved, um, for today's Melchizedek School. Um, young people are having vigil tonight. Hallelujah. And um, we are, where is um, Melchizedek School? Don't they have the banner? We um, also would be having, um, apart from the watches, coming up um, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., we'll be having Preparing His Bride on saturday but before that we have open book study tomorrow hallelujah um from 6 p.m so i want to encourage you um to make yourself available in some form or fashion um thank you so much for joining us beloved um during a special time in god's word and in prayer i really hope this blesses you jesus loves you bye-bye